Okay, great. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, before we get started, I want to thank the uh, various uh, departments and organizations that made this talk possible. Uh, the Department of History, the Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures, the Classical Studies Program, Religious Studies, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Miller Lecture Fund, and the Committee on Lectures. <clears throat> Um, our speaker tonight is. Before you introduce the speaker, would you move the platform over? Sure. Please see the full slide instead of moving the slides. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. 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 Can everyone see on outside now? Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, Guy Stern is a lecturer and doctoral candidate at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he is the translator of Gianfranco Moneta's Jubileo 2000, uh, but his more important work is uh, coming out right about now uh, on the Arapacus, and uh, he's also written important things about POWs in antiquity. Um, most Roman history is written by elites and for elites, but <coughs> Gaius reveals what's possible when we look beyond the uh, literary evidence to material culture, particularly coinage. Uh, coins, after all, are the only mass-produced texts from antiquity, and while they're still produced by the elites, they are uh, something that is designed as a message for everyone, not just other elites. Um, and his talk illustrates what is, possible, uh, what is possible to learn when you start looking at the numismatic evidence for the beginning of the Roman Empire. And so I give you Guy Stern. <laughs> Just let me know when you need to okay. okay. uh, I would also like to thank all of the proper departments who made it possible for me to come to Iowa today to do this talk. The Department of History, Foreign Languages and Literature, Classical Studies, Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the Miller Lecture Fund. So I thank all for making this trip possible. And I'd like to tell you how I came about to do this project. Uh, most of the time these days, I come around and I give talks about the Arapacus, which is what I wrote my dissertation on. And this project ended up arising from my studies of the Arapacus, uh, where I sort of by accident discovered that Agrippa really was the other emperor of Rome, and that everybody's forgotten that. And I couldn't figure out why that would happen, because he's a very important character. And as David said, the elites write history for elites. So that kind of thing should have survived. But it didn't. Uh, I offer several fast reasons and don't go very long into it in my lecture, which I'll read in maybe a minute or two. But uh, I've pondered it longer, and I remember that a great deal of classical historian literature you know, is completely lost. Uh, we have less than half of what Tacitus wrote, maybe uh, quarter or a third of what Dio wrote, many other things that just completely disappeared entirely. We've heard of these people like, um, I don't know, Phanius Caipio, who write history, but nothing's left at all. So uh, I entertain the possibility that some of those guys actually spelled it out, that Agrippa really was emperor, but we don't have any of those manuscripts at all today. Uh, I had to go backwards by using the coinage and various oddball government stuff in order to figure out that Agrippa was emperor himself, uh, which is now the story I will relate to you, as best I can. A famous story recorded in Suetonius, Life of the Divine Augustus, 94.12, says that the teenage Gaius Octavius, the future Caesar Augustus, and his friend Marcus Vipsonius Agrippa went to the renowned astrologer Theogenes to consult about their fortunes. Agrippa spoke first and was told he would achieve incredible heights. Octavius then drew back. He no longer wished to reveal the details of his own birth or know his own fortune because Agrippa's was so impressive, Octavius's could hardly compare. However, pressed hard both by Agrippa and by Theogenes, he reluctantly yielded and he revealed the details of his birth, the time, the place, the astrological signs, this sort of thing. Theogenes computed the fortune and then threw himself at Octavius's feet and proclaimed that Octavius would one day rule the world. This prognostication proved accurate, as some years later, the boy Augustus, uh, Gaius Octavius, ruled the Roman Empire as the first emperor, Augustus. Suetonius says for this reason, he later minted a coin with the astrological pronouncement on it. This is our first slide. Uh, so here, you see, I'll even get out the pointer, 
because I know the quality of the slide looks so much better on the computer than it does on the screen. Uh, so Augustus is on the far side. This right here is the rudder, the rudder of state. That shows that Augustus is, you know, controlling the state well, being a good helmsman. And this is Capricorn, the zodiacal sign under which he was conceived, rather than that under which he was born. So that's how they worked it out. In no less a way do coins illustrate the magnificent career of Agrippa, thrice consul, thrice offered a triumph, a member of multiple religious colleges, a uh, holder of Maius Imperium and Tribunician Potestas, and the husband of Julia, the daughter of Augustus. He also was the other princeps of the state, meaning, to me, he was the other emperor, co-emperor of Rome. This is occasionally alluded to in certain literary texts, but is largely forgotten today. Many scholars instead prefer to see Agrippa as an heir to Augustus rather than his equal. Three reasons, probably, account for this low estimate of Agrippa's status. Firstly, although he was equal to Augustus in auctoritas, he lagged behind him in terms of dignitas, and these are important Roman qualities. He never, or almost never, used the term imperator, which is what Romans call victorious generals and then emperors. Secondly, his death occurred so shortly after his elevation that his reign, which is not quite the right word for it, but it's the best I have, was easily forgotten. Thirdly, Suetonius did not write a biography of him in the Twelve Caesars. In fact, Suetonius almost omits him from the Twelve Caesars, perhaps because of number one, what I said before. And I sat and counted out how many references there were to Agrippa, many of which have nothing to do with imperial power, but altogether there are 16. And then I compared this to the son of Tiberius, Drusus the Younger, who was also co-emperor with his father and died first, but didn't do anything. He amounted to nothing. And he has 13 references. So you can see that they're almost equally uh, uh, equal attention to these two, even though one of them is far less important than the other in every measure. The literary sources record Augustus Agrippa's rise to power and the proof for his short reign, but that's largely on Roman coinage, principally coins issued from 13 and 12 BC. Were it not for these few coin issues, struck to announce the escalation of his status to that of co-emperor, or princeps, as Romans would call him, we would not at all know about Agrippa's multiple priesthoods or the grandeur that greeted his return to Rome simultaneous to Augustus's in 13 BC, when his status was announced. For it was the acquisition of multiple priesthoods that marked out a junior colleague of the emperor. This is how Augustus handles things and how Tiberius also handles things. Therefore, the escalation with all these powers in the multiple priesthoods became the mark of the heir to the empire, and then earlier, actually, junior emperor. Okay, so to begin with Agrippa's earlier career. The Latin town of Arpinum claims three famous sons from Roman antiquity, Marius, Cicero, and Agrippa. All three were noeomenes. While Marius and Cicero were well attested as native sons, the claim that Agrippa likewise hails from this small hill town about 60 miles from Rome derives only from local tradition. Pope Pius II, between 1458 and 64, wrote to his general Napoleone Orsini, and he mentioned the park at Arpinum, which was famous on account of Marius and Cicero, and he didn't mention Agrippa at all. Uh, the local historian Clavelli, in his Antico Arpino from 1623, doesn't mention Agrippa either. But if you go to Arpinum today, in front of the high school, Reale, Liceo, Ginnasio, Tulliano, there are three busts, Agrippa, Cicero, and Marius. Also, we know very little about Agrippa's family. His father's name was Lucius. A sister built the Porticus Vipsaniae at the Circus Maximus after Agrippa died. Nicolaus of Damascus, in his uh, biography of Julius Caesar, records an older brother about whom we know nothing. The brother was a follower of Cato Udicensis, Cato the Younger. This older brother was captured at the Battle of Thapsus, and he would have been executed had not Octavius intervened and asked Julius to spare him. This information helps explain a strange passage in Dio 54.11.6, when an ex-consul says to Agrippa, hey, and what about your brother? But Agrippa doesn't respond. We don't understand what this means until we hear, oh, Nicolaus de Damascus tells us there's a brother. The brother must have lived beyond Actium and well after, but he's not active in Roman politics. Agrippa was certainly with Octavius at Apollonia, when news arrived that Julius had been assassinated on the Ides of March in 44 BC. They were studying at Apollonia together. He advised Octavius to assemble 
the loyal Caesarian troops in Macedon and to march on Rome when both were still unaware that Julius had adopted Octavius. Agrippa accompanied him to Italy, and again, at Brindisium, he advised him to collect a private army. But again, Octavius refused. Octavius then acknowledged his adoption, and he took the name Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. Well, I'll call him Caesar for most of this paper. With every intention of peaceful interactions with Mark Antony so that he could inherit the wealth Julius had left him. But Antony did not cooperate. Relations with Antony deteriorated rapidly, so that later that year, 44, when Agrippa for a third time suggested they raise a private army, Caesar accepted his advice, and they raised a private army. <coughs> for the contest with Antony, Caesar gathered around him some very formidable military talent, namely Q. Savidianus Rufus, Agrippa, Titus Tetilius Taurus, and Lucius Aruntius. Other comrades included uh, Mycenas, uh, Lucius Cornificius, Gaius Procolaeus, and Lucius Vinicius. These are rather less, lesser guys, but still important guys. Caesar Octavian had a special skill of finding and promoting the most talented men without discriminating against them based on their low birth. Not only were these other men dependent upon him and loyal for their elevation, but if they ever broke with him, they would find it very difficult to appoint him, oppose him. They lack a name like Caesar. Antony, on the other hand, had only the lukewarm support of the other generals of Julius at that time, and it was a rocky beginning when the war started. In the first major clash of that war, the consuls Hirtius and Ponza and Caesar defeated Antony at the Battle of Mutina on April 14, 43 BC. But the consuls were slain. One in the battle, the other was mortally wounded. Caesar then demanded the consulship from the Senate. The Senate at first refused. Rebuffed, he forced them and then turned to his foe of only a few weeks before. In autumn 43, he formed the second triumvirate with Antony and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. Once in power, the second triumvirate purged the Senate. Many innocent but wealthy men were executed and their estates were confiscated to finance a war of revenge against the assassins of the divine Julius. The Lex Pedia reversed Antony's earlier amnesty and allowed the Caesareans to try the assassins for the murder of Julius. Agrippa prosecuted Cassius, Cornificius prosecuted Brutus, and uh, Titius prosecuted Casca. The assassins were banished without fire and water, which is the most extreme form of banishment. The showdown with the assassins occurred in October 42, in two battles at Philippi, after which Cassius and then Brutus committed suicide successively. The Republican cause was lost. So most of the surviving Republicans surrendered to the triumvirates, including Domitius Aenobarbus and Marcus Valerius Massala Corvinus. Those who insisted on fighting longer had no choice but to go to Sextus Pompey. <coughs> Antony and Caesar then divided the empire. Caesar returned to Italy to settle the veterans, while Antony remained in the east to punish those who had helped Brutus and Cassius. However, Antony's wife and brother took issue with Caesar's methods, and they rose up against him in 41 in what we call the Perusine War. Caesar, Savidianus Rufus, and Agrippa, who was serving as praetor, isolated Lucius Antonius in Perusia, and they drove off the relief forces led by the consul, Asinius Pollio, uh, a man who had succeeded Octavian in the consulship, Ventidius Bassus, and another recent consul, Munatius Plancus. Finally, Lucius Antonius surrendered in early 40, and the war ended. Agrippa had played a secondary but valuable role in that victory. During the war, Caesar's right-hand man had been Savidianus Rufus. Not only do Dio and Appian say so, but a most amusing additional source of information confirms this. The glandes, those are sling bullets, uh, on display at the museum in Parma, recovered from the battlefields around Perusia, bear messages such as, screw you, Octavian, and go to hell, Savidianus Rufus, things like this, but they don't mention Agrippa at all. He was too junior commander to single out for distinction or even hostility. So for his valuable services in that war, Savidianus Rufus, rather than Agrippa, was the one who was selected for escalation. He was offered the consulship of the year 39. However, though brimming with talent and ambition, Savidianus was unable to spot a winner. As the governor of Transalpine Gaul, he conspired to betray Caesar to Antony that same year, 40. So first they win, and then he tries to betray him. When Antony came to terms with Caesar at Brindisium in October of 40, he revealed to Caesar Savidianus Rufus's treachery. Caesar, white hot at this betrayal, had Savidianus tried and sentenced to death. 
Savidianus committed suicide. We're going to see that quite a bit. The removal of Savidianus propelled two of Caesar's confederates forward in his place, Agrippa and Statilius Taurus. Agrippa replaced Savidianus in Transalpine Gaul in 39, having just finished his year as praetor in Rome. In 38, Agrippa won a great victory over the Aquitani, their Gallic tribe, for which he was offered a triumph and also the consulship of 37. Taurus was sent to Lucania, his home region in southern Italy, to raise troops for the next foe, the pirate Sextus Pompey. In late 40, Caesar had married the daughter of a Pompeian partisan. Her name was Scribonia, and she was the aunt of Sextus's wife. Peculiarly, both are named Scribonia. In the efforts to open a peace channel with Sextus, uh, Octavian did this marriage. The second triumvirate then came to terms with and recognized Sextus Pompey in the Pact of Mycenaeum in spring 39, by the terms of which Sextus was restored to his rights. He was promised a priesthood in the College of Augurs, and he received Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, as well as Achaea in Greece, to govern. He was also offered a consulship. But the marriage did very little to preserve the peace, and pretty soon war began again. Caesar claimed he could not stand his nagging wife, so he divorced her. But by that time, hostilities had already started. In the first contest in 38, another lieutenant of Caesar, Calvisius Sabinus, lost a naval battle to Sextus in the Bay of Naples. A second defeat followed near Regium in, August, in autumn 38. Uh, now in dire straits, Caesar wrote to Agrippa up in Gaul, asked him to come down and take over command of the war. Agrippa, of course, was offered the consulship of 37 as his reward. Uh, let's see the next slide here. Yeah, so this is a coin he mints having learned he's going to be consul. And we see on this coin Julius right there and Octavian, Caesar Octavian right here, face to face. So having learned he's consul, he makes this coin. He comes down to Italy, takes up the consulship, and he sets to work on building and training a fleet to fight Sextus at Lake Avernus over the winter of 37. Having renewed the conflict with Sextus without having consulted Antony, Caesar severely strained his alliance in the triumvirate with Antony. He sent Mycenaeus to Antony to plead for help, and meanwhile coordinated a new offensive against Sextus with Agrippa, Taurus, and Lepidus from Africa. Hope came from Antony, but slowly. By the time Antony's triremes arrived, Agrippa had built a new fleet. Uh, Octavian, Caesar, turned away Antony and said, don't need you anymore. But Octavia, his sister, persuaded the triumvirate to cooperate. So reinforced with 130 ships from Antony, Caesar and Agrippa engaged Sextus in a new offensive that included a triple invasion of Sicily. At Nalicus on September 3rd, 36, Agrippa showed his mettle and dealt Sextus a crippling defeat. Sextus fled east, where he was eventually put to death by one of Antony's lieutenants. Immediately after Sextus' defeat, Lepidus claimed Sicily for himself, based on his successful invasion of the island, and he made a bid for greater status in the triumvirate. Caesar completely outmaneuvered him. He forced Lepidus to surrender. Lepidus was do dropped from the triumvirate, although he was allowed to retain his office as high priest of the Roman religion, Pontifex Maximus, a clement gesture that Caesar was to come back and regret. It haunted him for 23 years, because Lepidus didn't die. Taurus was then sent to conquer Africa from Lepidus' forces, an operation he accomplished brilliantly and bloodlessly. He got everyone to surrender without a blood. On November 13, 36, Caesar returned to Rome and celebrated an ovatio, that's a mini triumph, in which he granted Agrippa a rostral crown as the architect of the victory. Agrippa was very proud of this crown and wore it in many triumphal processions. It appears on several coins, I'll show them soon, but not yet, uh, including some posthumous issues to mark him out for honor. The War of the Sextus had created three heroes. Agrippa, above all, won credit for winning the war. Taurus also had acquired the great prize of Africa without a blow. Third, Messala Corvinus, who had come over from the Republicans, rescued Caesar in a particularly low moment. When the final confrontation with Antony arrived, Caesar had a trio of stellar generals on whom to rely, not to mention Lucius Arentius, who commanded the center of the fleet at Actium. In the Actium campaign, Agrippa served as fleet admiral and won the battle. Messala Corvinus launched a propaganda war against Antony and replaced him as consul of 31. He shared official joint command of the war against Antony and Cleopatra. At Actium, Messala Corvinus commanded the right wing. Taurus commanded the land forces in Greece. 
Meanwhile, Maecenas administered Italy and maintained the home front. By comparison, Antony had long ago dismissed his most able commander, Ventidius Bassus, whose terrific victory over the Parthians greatly overshadowed Antony's own meager accomplishments. His other commanders were able enough, but Cleopatra routinely overruled them. Several, such as Demetrius Ahenobarbus, exasperated beyond the straining point, quit and defected and went over to Caesar's side. Following Actium, Caesar sent Agrippa and Mycenaeus back to Italy with the discharged veterans, but the pair proved unable to handle the demands of rival interests in Italy. Agrippa wrote to Caesar that his personal presence was required, so Caesar spent the winter of 3130 going back and forth across the Mediterranean Sea. This underscores an important lacking on Agrippa's part that requires special attention and emphasis, and I think it helps explain why he's neglected by later historians. Although Agrippa was the greatest general alive, he did not possess enough dignitas to cow the diverse interests of the Senate and people in Italy. Only Caesar had that at this point. This lack was to repeatedly dog Agrippa for the next two decades, and as emperor, Augustus went to great lengths to remedy this. Rome was a very hierarchical, class-conscious society. People forget that today. Men of great birth disdained to take orders from Agrippa, and sometimes even men of lower birth refused to follow one of their own in certain affairs. Uh, we see this in the British army in the Napoleonic era as well. This is a common quality. Uh, Agrippa just simply not, lacks the dignitas that the nobility in ancient Rome possess inherently. As a brief point of reference, again, another example of this, Marriage ties often serve as an indicator of dignitas because they illustrate class mobility in relation to one's in-laws. The lower person tries to marry up. The higher person almost never wants to marry down. They do it for money, not for class. Caesar had married first Scribonia of an old plebeian family and then the aristocratic Livia, who's descended from the Claudii, one of the most important families in Rome. Masala Corvinus had married the patrician Aurelia, who is a kinswoman of the divine Joyus. The wife of Statilius Taurus is undocumented, but from the nomenclature of their second son, Cicena Statilius Taurus, we know she has, or I know, I should say, she has to be a Cornelia Cicena. That's a, a lesser branch of the Cornelii family, which is also one of the most important patrician families in Rome. Agrippa's first wife was Caecilia Attica, the daughter of Cicero's great friend Pomponius Atticus. Although Atticus was friend to many great Roman aristocrats, he was an eques, not a nobleman and as such of medium birth. The medium stature of Agrippa's wedding did nothing to elevate him in the eyes of his class-conscious contemporaries. He must often have heard contemptuous remarks such as, and uh, who's your father? Which is what people said to Cicero when they didn't like him and interrupted him to take Cicero down a peg, to reminding him of his low birth. An additional anecdote tells much the same story. At the end of his life, Augustus evaluated the aptitude for empire of several of his foremost contemporaries. They were all three still alive, and Augustus is dying. Uh, Manius Aemilius Lepidus, a distant relation of the triumvir, was judged capable, but too much of a republican. He was disdainful of monarchy. Gaius Asinius Gallus was ambitious enough, but not up to the task. And Lucius Aruntius, the old marshal, was capable and would have taken over had he not so admired Augustus, whom he served loyally for 50 years. Tacitus notes, that many sources have substituted Calpurnius Piso for Aruntius. Manius Lepidus and Piso both hail from some of the most noble families in Rome. Asinius Gallus is second generation, but an exceedingly capable man and a fine orator. Aruntius, like Agrippa, was a Noah's Omo, and despite his abilities, he would not have had ease holding together a great empire with that low birth. He would have faced great senatorial resistance. Nevertheless, the fact that the most capable follower at Augustus' death was a loyal Noah Somo, a new man in politics, some sums up the strength of the Augustan regime. So, now we move back to Agrippa. Having won the Battle of Actium and conquered Egypt, Caesar set about reorganizing the Republic. He held the consulship every year instead of exercising some non-Republican source of power, such as dictatorship. His fellow consul in 29 was his nephew, Sextus Apuleius. On July 1st, another of the Valeri Masala family came in and took office after Sextus resigned. Agrippa shared the Fosces with him in both 28 and 27, Taurus in 26. <coughs> Dio 52.1 to 40, almost the whole book, 
records an idealized debate in imitation of Herodotus 3.80 to 84 between Agrippa and Mycenaeus on whether the Republic should be restored or monarchy established. In truth, this dialogue never took place. The real discussion probably included Messala Corvinus, Statilius Taurus, Sextus Apuleius, and Lucius Aruntius all, and the real topic of debate was probably how to disguise monarchy as a republic so that you don't have another Ides of March. They came up with a solution. In January 27, Caesar resigned his extraordinary power and returned to the Senate many of its powers, including the right to govern non-military provinces and select the governors. The Senate responded by granting to Caesar numerous additional honors. On January 16, 27, Munatius Plancus proposed that Caesar be given the name Augustus, sacred one, for his services to the state. The third consulship of Agrippa, meanwhile, establishes beyond a doubt that he had become the number two man in the empire, and for all practical purposes, Taurus is number three. Mycenaeus and Masala Corvinus barely lagged behind them, although Mycenaeus refused to accept formal governmental posts, and Masala Corvinus resigned his almost immediately, just after six days, claiming he didn't know what he was supposed to do. It is possible that Masala Corvinus sought to avoid conflict with Agrippa and or Mycenaeus, with whom he felt at cross purposes. He was too much of a Republican, they were too much of imperialists. Without peril to himself, Masala Corvinus traversed a narrow path others proved unable to imitate. He refused to settle for fourth place behind Agrippa, Mycenaeus, and Statilius Taurus, but he avoided defending Augustus at the same time. His reputation survived and remained above reproach even after he said, I always fought on the more just side at the Battle of Philippi. That's why I fought with Brutus. The new regime faced repeated challenges after Messala Corvinus resigned. Sometimes from within, and as early as the scandal of Cornelius Gallus in 26, there are many other scandals. Augustus had appointed Cornelius Gallus governor of Egypt after the conquest. News came that he was abusing his authority, including that he was erecting statues of himself to vaunt his accomplishments, self-congratulatory inscriptions, and even put his name on the pyramids. Now, there's no pyramid that has his name on this today, but this is the story that comes down. Gallus was recalled from Egypt and indicted. Before the trial even began, the Senate voted that he should be convicted and that his property should be confiscated. Gallus committed suicide. This resolution rang of tyranny because Gallus had no opportunity to defend himself. A series of other crises involved erupted, especially in 2322. The governor of Thrace, Marcus Primus, was accused of treason for making war on a tribe called the Odrizi without permission from the Senate. Augustus's consular colleague, Varro Morena, defended Primus in court. Primus claimed that Augustus had told him to make the attack. Augustus came to the court and denied it in person. Morena, his case now compromised by Augustus, challenged Augustus's presence in a legal matter that did not concern him. Augustus replied he was there for the common good, which was always a matter of concern to him. Primus was convicted. Varro, suffered, Varro Morena suffered disgrace. Primus committed suicide. Uh, Varro Moreno was forced to resign his consulship, and smarting from his disgrace, he formed a conspiracy to assassinate Augustus. In Varro Moreno's place as consul, Augustus pulled off a coup. He persuaded an old-fashioned Republican and enemy, a former follower of Brutus, to accept office. That's Gnaeus Calpurnius Piso, the father of the guy I spoke about just a couple minutes ago. Thus, the regime gained the endorsement of a famous recalcitrant Republican at a critical time. It was very important to look as Republican as possible in bad times like this. But the bad news is not over. There was a famine. After that, the Tiber flooded. Shortly after that, Augustus fell ill. Near death, he handed to Agrippa and to Piso his signet ring and the papers of state, respectively. From this, Others inferred that Agrippa, as the second man in the state, would become Princepsimatus, but that Piso, as consul, would govern the state as chief executive and select a new consular colleague. Miraculously, Augustus recovered. But, fearful of the disaffection he had now aroused, he resolved to make the regime appear less autocratic and more republican. He resigned his ninth consecutive consulship on July 1st, and in his place, he selected another former follower of Brutus, a man named Lucius Cestius. The Senate created for Augustus a new power, the Tribunician Potestas, and they offered him a permanent 
proconsulship. One notes that Augustus dates his power from 23 BC rather than 27, as we see from coins, which usually spell out the number of times he was hailed imperator or the number of years he had tribunicin potestas. All of these events I've just mentioned reveal the fragile nature of Augustus's veiled monarchy. While he claimed to have restored the Republic, in reality the regime was a monarchy, and those who opposed it too energetically often ended up committing suicide. Only the united efforts of all of Augustus's confederates held it together. Yet, another crisis soon erupted that revealed not only the fragile nature of the regime, but how greatly it depended upon Agrippa. Strangely, Augustus only realized this after he made the error of releasing Agrippa. Marcellus, Augustus's nephew, served as Adon in 23 BC. He hosted lavish games financed by Augustus. As the recipient of Augustus's favor, he believed that he would be promoted to become Augustus's partner over the heads of Agrippa, Mycenaeus, Taurus, and the others. Agrippa also believed it. In peak, he announced he was quitting Rome, and he departed with his second wife, Marcella Meyer, who happens to be Marcellus's sister. They went to Asia. Augustus tried to cover up this political embarrassment by giving Agrippa a diplomatic post, but Agrippa ignored the appointment and he settled on the island of Lesbos in Mytilene to watch affairs at Rome from afar. This was a pattern Tiberius followed many years later. The regime suffered heavily, although Augustus was too stubborn to admit it. Agrippa had really been the workhorse of the regime, winning its greatest military victories and devoting himself tirelessly to its preservation and advancement like no other man. During the 30s and the 20s, he had worked tirelessly to improve downtown Rome with building projects that improved the urban masses provided the urban masses with employment and improved their quality of life, such as the Baths of Agrippa, the Aqua Julia, the Aqua Virga, the Pons Agrippa, the Pantheon, the Derivatorium, and many others. As Cura he had improved the sewers to the benefit of everyone. His absence pulled out a key pillar of support for the regime, but Augustus, angered by Agrippa's behavior, refused to placate his old friend or invite him back. Suddenly, Marcellus fell ill. He died almost at once, fostering rumors that his death was unnatural. Had Agrippa been in Rome, he would be the prime suspect. According to Dio 53.33.4, rumors circulated that Livia poisoned Marcellus. She was put on trial, but they couldn't get an indictment, so it was dismissed. Augustus now was left to preserve order from the chaos without Agrippa's help. He turned to one of his other close confederates for help. Aruntius, the veteran of Actium, was induced to run for a long overdue consulship. A former Republican and Pompeian sympathizer, Marcus Claudius Marcellus Iserninus, otherwise an obscure fellow, uh, became Aruntius' colleague as consul in 22. But Augustus, Aruntius, and Claudius had difficulty handling the number of crises that consumed the year 22. The Tiber flooded again. Then a second famine broke out. Many Romans felt these natural disasters struck because Augustus was not serving as consul. There was a popular outcry to make him dictator to handle these emergencies. He refused the post. In fact, this is a rather famous thing. He pulled off his toga in the forum and said, I'd rather you put a sword in me than put a dictatorship on me. So they gave up. Then the conspiracy of Varro Morena came to light. The secret police foiled the plot, but Mycenaeus revealed its discovery to his wife, Terentia. Terentia happened to be Morena's sister. Word got out. Suicide was Varro Morena's only option. The Senate then ordered that Varro Morena be retroactively removed from the consular Fasti in a damnatio memoriae to erase his existence. Again, the regime was a casualty. Suetonius says Augustus was so dissatisfied, he distrusted Mycenaeus from then on, and their relations were never the same. Maybe. An external rebellion followed. The Cantabrian Nestores revolted in Spain. Then the people tried to elect Augustus censor to help clear things up. He refused the post. A grim omen followed that. The two new censors, Munatius Plancus and Pallas Emilius Lepidus, mounted a tribunal. It collapsed under them. They fell. Ah. Then the people tried to elect Augustus consul for 21. So they only returned one candidate, Marcus Lollius. Augustus refused to take that office also, and he told them to elect a new consul. Violence marred the first election. Finally, Quintus Emilius Lepidus was elected amid uproar with the other candidate, Junius Alonus. Augustus finally admitted out loud that they could not manage Rome like this. Uh, the efforts of Statilius Taurus and Runtius weren't enough. 
he needed Agrippa. So, in 21, he recalled Agrippa from Mytilene. The recall in late 21 represents a real turning point for Agrippa. To secure his position, lest he again be set aside, Agrippa must have demanded a vouchsafe. He received Augustus' daughter Julia, now a widow, in marriage. Simultaneously, he also received Maius Imperium for several years. Uh, Add style 54.6.5 makes clear. Agrippa received this marriage and the Maius Imperium both in order to raise his dignitas above all others. From this point forwards, Agrippa was recognized de facto and de jure as the second man in the empire. No one besides Augustus had ever received Maius Imperium, and in later years, the grant of Maius Imperium and Tribunician Potestas together mark out the selection of an imperial successor. At this time, Augustus was just inventing the process, so his contemporaries may not have immediately understood it the way we can with the benefit of hindsight. Above all else, the promotion of Agrippa had to be couched in Republican terms. The promotion of Agrippa was meant to deflect accusations of Augustus's monarchy by showing that there were two men with all this power cooperating to govern the state with the consuls. Contrary to many modern scholars' interpretation, it is not the marriage of Agrippa and Julia that stands, makes him stand out as the Tribunician Potestas and the Maius Imperium. The marriage was much less of a dynastic arrangement than an enhancement of Agrippa's dignitas, because now he had a really important patrician bride. Until Livia turned 40, Augustus may still have had hopes that Livia would bear him a son, because Romans believed the typical age for women to stop bearing children is 40, although Pliny records there are many examples of women up to the age of 50 bearing children. The regime really needed Agrippa's firm hand if it was to survive, so Agrippa now set out to transform their partnership with Augustus into a cloaked biarchy. Not a monarchy, but a biarchy. This was no easy matter. Despite Agrippa's many military qualifications, he remained to the Senate an outsider, not a man of family, in a system that jealously guarded against outsiders. Just as Caecilius Metellus had mocked Cicero for his lack of political family, Agrippa also lacked family connections. To overcome the perception that Agrippa was an upstart Noah's homo, Augustus wrapped him in a toga of dignitas and gravitas that the old families would find difficult to fail to acknowledge. <coughs> okay. Now, Agrippa and his escalation, and Tribunician Potestas, the biarchy. An escalation of Agrippa's powers followed rapidly. This consisted of a number of distinctions, a patrician bride, multiple priesthoods, and numerous commands. Augustus used every medium available to enhance Agrippa's standing. Agrippa continued to build projects in Roman Italy as a patron of the plebs in the traditional Roman sense. He held commands over several different armies to familiarize all the troops in the empire with him. He visited many of the provinces in tours to get to know the empire better. His sons-in-law were made consuls. In, the tw in 20, Agrippa's and Julia's first son, ja Gaius, my name, was born. That same year, the mint at Nemausus printed printed several issues acknowledging Agrippa and Augustus as their co-founders. The most famous of these issues depicts on the obverse let me find the, button here, the heads of Augustus and Agrippa, and you can see which one's which. This is Augustus, and he's wearing a laurel wreath, and this is Agrippa, and he's wearing a rostral crown, what he got after they won the Battle of uh, Nilocus. Uh, they're in a pose back-to-back, -back, reminiscent of an earlier coin pairing the divine Julius with Caesar Octavian in a very similar pose, and that's the next point. Yeah, so here we have the pair again, uh, and it's a little bit harder to tell which one is Caesar, and which, which one is Julius, and which one is uh, Augustus, but that's Augustus, I think, and that's Julius. He's the god, he's the man. Uh, and on the way, the ship, I'm not really sure what it is. Okay, just uh, a ship mark or something. Uh, this is the earliest known signal on coinage of Agrippa's elevation beyond the other marshals shortly after his marriage to Julia. In 19, while Augustus toured, toured the east, Agrippa went to Gaul to counter the Germans. Statilius Taurus stayed in Italy and ran the home front. When this task was accomplished, Agrippa went to Spain and he brought the remainder of the Iberian Peninsula under Roman rule. In 18, he returned to Rome and received Tribunicum and Potestas equal to that of Augustus, which made him the second most powerful man in the empire. The next year, Julia bore him a second son, 
Lucius, whom Augustus adopted along with Gaius, according to Roman ritual by purchase. Livia was now 40 years old. Augustus did not think she was going to bear him a child. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay. The year 17 also saw the Ludius Secularis, at which, according to the inscription on uh, CIL, Corpus Inscriptiones Latinum, Latinum uh, 6.3232.3, Augustus and Agrippa jointly presided. Augustus issued a considerable number of coins in 17 to announce the celebration of the Ludus Secularis. Uh, this one depicts uh, a herald announcing the beginning of the games. So he's an archaic guy dressed up. There are two very similar coins, but they're not quite identical, as you can see. Uh, the shield is blank on this one, got something on this one. The writing is a little different on their names, perhaps, but it's almost the same. It's the same coin, really. Uh, next coin. Okay, uh, the next coin here depicts a quindecum weir, probably Augustus, but possibly Agrippa, distributing sufimenta, with which one cleans oneself and one's home before the celebration. So here he is, the quindecum weir, handing out sufimenta, which is kind of like soap, but not exactly. It's more like chalk than soap. Uh, and these guys are standing in line to pick it up. Okay, the quindecum weary are the college in the Roman religion that runs the secular games every 110 years. And Agrippa, we know, is a quindecum weir, so one of these two coin, you know, this is either Augustus or Agrippa, and we have no real way of knowing. You know, I think it says uh, ludus, for the ludus, lud s secularis, there. Okay. Uh, on the final night of the Ludus Secularis, May 28, 17, a special sacrifice of a sow served as nocturnal climax for the ceremonies, marking the arrival of the New Age. And this scene also we have on the next coin. And there are two almost identical coins, and it's hard to tell what's going on here, but here, of course, you have Augustus' face. And on this side, that's the little altar right there. That's a pig. It's a pregnant sow. And then there are two men dressed in togas, and they're going to sacrifice that sow. Uh, now, one of these two coins, this one, says cum uh, gabiis, and the other one doesn't say that. And there's some suspicion that this coin is a forgery. We're not sure, but this one seems authentic. Okay. So, also in 17, aside from the Ludus Secularis, the Germans invaded the, the province of Gaul and defeated the governor, Marcus Lollius. In 16, Augustus went to Gaul to straighten matters out personally. At the same time, Agrippa departed for Syria to attend to Eastern affairs. Note the reversal. Uh, back in 19, it was Augustus who went to Syria and Agrippa who went to Gaul, and now they switched places so that Agrippa can see another part of the empire. No coinage was minted in Rome from 15 to 14, but the year 13 saw a production of a whole series of gold and silver coins to commemorate Augustus and Agrippa. These coins go beyond corroborating textual evidence to illustrate the political change in Rome during this time of transition. When combined with Dio and other sources, the numismatic evidence verifies my claim that the year 13 was one of celebration for Agrippa, one in which he was elevated for the first time to a position nearly equal to that of Augustus. And 13 was also the year Agrippa's two sons-in-law, Publius Quintilius Varus and Tiberius Claudius Nero, were the consuls in Rome. Now, even if we didn't have this sort of information from the literary sources, we would guess it from this new burst of coinage you're about to see. An extra large series minted freshly compensates for the void of 15 and 14. A number of coins show Augustus as princeps on one side, and on the reverse, something else, very often Agrippa or imagery about Agrippa. These coins have two heads and no tails. Let's go see the next one. Uh, I'm sorry, it's such a bad picture. This is Augustus on the head side, although since they both have heads, you wouldn't really know. And this is Agrippa on the tails. And we have two images of the same coin. Go again. Yes, sir. Yeah. You can barely see it better. This might be a little better of a picture. And it's, uh, the coins are not identical, but it's like minting um, an Iowa nickel and a Minnesota nickel. They're at the same value and they have pretty close to the same picture on one side and pretty close to the same picture on the other. Okay, so uh, this pairing of the two men represents an honor that no one else ever enjoyed in Augustus' long reign or lifetime, not even his successor Tiberius. These are the only coins that have heads and heads. Uh, on a few of these coins, including the next one, go ahead, uh, Agrippa wears a corona navalis that was given to him in 36 after winning the uh, Nalakis. So here he is, and actually this crown 
There are two crowns combined in one, and I've forgotten the name of the other one. One has walls, a mural crown, I think, and the other has got the ship's ram right there. So it's the naval crown. So he wears two kind of pressed together. Uh, the mural crown with these castle walls, uh, that's for some town he took in Spain. <coughs> okay, now, for his services in Asia Minor, Agrippa was offered in 14 a third triumph by the Senate, which he refused for a third time. Uh, although no one knew it, go to the next one. Uh, the last triumph celebrated in 19 by Cornelius Balbus was the last triumph ever celebrated by somebody outside the imperial family. Uh, a coin, so here, this is a, see this chariot? Um, this is the triumphal chariot. There are four horses, it's a quadriga, the palm for the victor in the chariot. So this side is Augustus, this side's Agrippa. Augustus didn't get any triumphs in this era, so it could only be Agrippa's triumph. We know, because this is Trogus, the triumph where it says Gaius Marius Trogus, we know what year he was money, minting money. So this is why we know it's not an Augustan triumph, but Agrippa's. Uh, okay, so uh, this coin issued in 13 by Gaius Marius Tromentino or Trogus, uh, depicting Augustus and the Lituus up here, on one side, and an empty four-horse chariot and victory palm on the other, refers to the third triumph Agrippa rejected. Okay. Now, Agrippa did accept a renewal of his Chippenikin potestas in 13. Two different coins celebrate this, and multiple versions of each of these coins exist, and they circulate with only slightly different, litmus, uh, slightly different uh, images. They're basically the same, so don't worry about that. Uh, the first of these examples uh, depicts an empty bicellium. Now, this is the chair, or bench, on which a tribune sits, because this is tribunician potestas. Okay? The letters TR pot over the bicellium make clear that the coin marks the, ex the occasion in 13 upon which Augustus and Agrippa received their renewal of tribunician potestas for five more years. The reverse bears the name, the office, and the priesthood of the moneyer, which is how we date it. On the second coin, and we'll go to the next one, uh, Augustus and Agrippa sit side by side on the bicellium. So here they are, that's the bench right there, and they're sitting on these things, and they're just kind of, you can't really tell by their faces, those are just lumps, but it is Augustus and it is Agrippa. Uh, they're sitting on this bicellium on a platform decorated with the prows of ships. Now, these ships, prows down here, the rostra, uh, they might refer to some of Agrippa's naval battle victories. It's hard to know what that is. Actium, Nalakos, Mylai, maybe. Or maybe it's just in the forum where the speaker stands on the rostra. It's a little bit hard to tell. But you wouldn't put a bench up on the rostra. It's not all that wide. So. Uh, now, the other important thing of this image, the two men sit side by side as equals this time. This isn't a sense of Augustus is bigger or greater or Agrippa is inferior. Now they're equals. Okay. After returning to Rome in 13, Augustus and Agrippa also conducted a lectio, kind of like a census, of the Senate. This also is represented on coinage. Next coin. They stand together side by side. Augustus wearing an oak crown, his corona kiwica. I'm not sure how easily you can see it because this is not a very good picture, I'm sorry. But he's got an oak crown and no face, really. And Agrippa is wearing his double crown, the uh, mural and uh, rostral crown. And you can't really see it, but if you have the coin in front of you, you could. They hold scrolls, and they stand behind boxes of book rolls called capsi. Again, in this image, Agrippa appears as an equal partner to Augustus, a claim no one else in the empire could ever make while Augustus was alive. Uh, now, there are multiple issues of this coin, too. So uh, some of them have uh, just the litus here, and another one has a band of oak leaves, which is Augustus's corona kiwica, which he received for saving the lives of citizens. But uh, the coins have the same message. Uh, on this side, Augustus is great. On this side, Augustus and Agrippa are equal. Okay? Uh, this coin type, by the way, sends the message that Agrippa has now been elevated to a level very much approaching Augustus, if not equal. Now, a final coin rams home that message by commemorating the very double return of Augustus and Agrippa back to Rome. Uh, I have a new understanding of this coin. 
that uh, differs from many of my colleagues. <coughs> in the past, scholars have mistakenly assumed that this coin depicts Julia, in the middle, that's a woman, with her two sons, Gaius and Lucius. They're the boys that she bore to Agrippa that Augustus adopted. I dispute this identification for a number of reasons, not least of which Gaius and Lucius were legally Augustus's children, not Julia's in 13. Legally, they are her siblings, not her children. I also doubt that Augustus would dare make the sort of dynastic statement on a coin of his three children as early as 13 BC. That would invite more trouble with the assassins who, type of assassins who killed Julius. Augustus was far more conscientious of the Ides of March than modern scholars who failed to consider it appreciate. It weighed very heavily in his mind. Now, my third objection to that traditional identification is that the three heads are all the same size. In 13 BC, Gaius was seven years old, and Lucius was only about four years old. And four-year-olds and seven-year-olds have smaller heads than adults. Now, uh, it's important, uh, every Roman coin that I've ever seen that depicts children on them, including another one I'll show you in a few minutes, makes an effort to scale the children somewhat so that you won't think the children are adults. This would be the only coin in Roman history to depict two children, aged four and seven, as adults. So I don't think it's doing that. I don't think this is an exception. I think the rule holds fast. Instead, these three are all adults, which is why their heads are much the same size. And the adults are, of course, Augustus, Julia, and Agrippa. Doesn't matter if it's Agrippa, Julia, Augustus. Doesn't matter. But that's who those three heads are. Okay? This coin, by the way, is reminiscent of another coin I observe, minted during the triumphal era of Antony, Octavian, and Octavia. That coin marked the Pact of Tarentum, including the triremes Antony pledged to Caesar to fight with against Sextus Pompey. Uh, now we can see this. Oh, here it is. Okay. On these issues, and there are several of them, there are uh, uh, three different guys minted almost identical coins. Okay. Uh, on these issues, the triumvirs, that is, Antony here and Caesar Octavian there, are Jugate facing Octavia, the peacemaker, who settled the quarrel they were having. And it's very hard to read the inscription, but I, I can tell you, it says over on this side, although I don't know where it begins, I think, I think it might begin there. Uh, it says, Ant imp ter caus des iter et ter triwir re RPC, which I'll translate into English for you. <laughs> uh, Antony, imperator for the third time, consul to be a second time, and consul, consul, sorry, consul twice and consul to be a third time. Um, uh, try and we're uh, to restore the Republic. Now on this side, it's got the guy who minted it, Lucius Atratinus, who's one of the partisans who switches from Antony to Octavian. And it says Auger, uh, and he will be consul in a few years. That's what it says here. Okay. So uh, we've now seen the escalation and uh, attempts to make Agrippa look equal to Augustus up into 13. One additional dimension remains in terms of the enhancement of Agrippa's status. His religious standing had to be impeachable. To accomplish this, two methods were employed. Uh, first of all, he entered all of the top four religious colleges. Secondly, he made public appearances as a presiding sacral figure at many events. Uh, now, Agrippa's presence at the Ludus Secularis as a presiding quindecum weir, I mentioned already once. Uh, on the second occasion where he fit this bill, uh, it's the, he presided, uh, jointly presided, I should say, as a pontifex uh, at the Arapaca ceremony, which is our next slide. Now, I'm sorry this is dark, because normally you'd be able to see it a little more easily. But this is Agrippa. He's wearing a veil. One of the very few men to wear their togas over their heads, there are two in each college, and there are three colleges. This is the pontifical college here, which might end with Agrippa. Uh, there's a guy with a really funny-looking hat there, a flamen. And these guys are pontifices in the background. Not her, but him and him. That guy got a little axe. He's a Camillus. Uh, he's the Rex Acrorum. He's the, um, the Flamen, I think. Uh, and then you have some other people back here who are members of the imperial family. Uh, this is Julia, his wife. And on the other side, we have the Quintecum Weary and the Septum Weary. And again, the leading priest of those colleges, those guys also have their toga pulled over their head as a veil. So Augustus does as well. The two people on this side are Agrippa and Augustus. On the other side, some other guys who we don't need to talk about. But he's presiding at this ceremony as well. 
Uh, so you can see the Veil de Grippa walking at the end of the Pontifical College. Uh, in both of these cases, Agrippa's public role as a presiding priest demonstrates his new sacred sacral gravitas. Uh, no doubt there are other ceremonies that are not on record where he has to do much the same thing. The whole point is to advertise him far and wide. Now, uh, regarding Agrippa's entry into multiple religious colleges, we have very little information. Uh, Valerius Patricla, uh, Valerius Patricolus 2.127.1 says... Agrippa held multiple priesthoods, but he doesn't tell us which ones. That's all he says. He also says the same thing as Tertullius Taurus, and doesn't tell us that either. The exact colleges to which he belonged remained a mystery until one examines other coinage in 13 BC. Now, as we can see from our apocus here, uh, Agrippa was a pontifex by 13. Next slide. Uh, I think that this coin also shows Agrippa as a pontifex. On this side, we have Augustus and the Lituus. Uh, on the other side, we have a man in a toga, obviously Roman, holding a symbolum, which looks like a ladle. And that's the symbol of the Pontifical College. Okay? Uh, scholars have identified this figure as Augustus on both sides of the coin. Uh, but I don't think that's very likely. I think it's more likely that this guy is Agrippa. So you're marking him becoming a pontifex in 13 or so. Uh, maybe earlier as well. But there's every reason to put a coin out of Agrippa showing him as a pontifex if he's newly become one. 13, 14, you put it out to show it. But Augustus has been a pontifex for 30 years. Why would you put out a coin now, 28 years after he became pontifex, to show that he is still pontifex? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. So, uh, uh, Also, one has to remember, uh, you advertise something like this because Agrippa is from a new family. The Pontifical College is the oldest most aristocratic college in Rome. They only let in big patricians. They don't let in new upstarts. And yet, here's somebody on a coin in the Pontifical College. Uh, if it's not Agrippa, it's some other really interesting guy who just got into the Pontifical College. Okay, and I have some other ideas on this. Uh, let's go forward to the next one. <coughs> Another coin leads me to believe that Agrippa had added more to his resume than membership into the Pontifical College. Now, in 17, this coin was minted. It shows Augustus joining the fourth of the big four colleges. This is the Simplum Ladle, because Augustus is a Pontifex. This is the Augur's Lituus, because Augustus has been an Augur for um, over 25 years. Uh, this is the tripod, because he's a Quintecum Weir, and we know he's a Quintecum Weir back before the Ludus Seculares in 17. And then this patera here is for the Septum Weary, the fourth college. And he just got in in 17 or 16. And that's why this coin was put out. Shows that Augustus is now in the top four religious colleges. Next. Okay. Now we have another coin. Agrippa is on this side. Augustus is on this side. Same four things minted in 13. Now, there's no reason for me to put out in 13 a coin that says, yeah, four years ago, Augustus became a member of this college. I think it's talking about someone else. And I think that someone else is Agrippa. I think I might have a second image of the same thing. Is that true? Yeah, there's the same thing. Very similar coin. This time you can see the Lituus better, but it's the same image and the same idea. Now, I got this idea not out of blind faith, but from another coin minted much, much later. Okay, this coin was put out by uh, the Emperor Claudius in about AD 52. Okay, and that's not Claudius, that's a child. That's Nero, whom Claudius had not long ago adopted. <coughs> On this side, you have the simplum, like the ladle, the literus, the tripod, and the patera. Can you go backwards? Same reverse. And all the coins have the same reverse. Go forwards again. And the inscription on the edge of this coin reads that uh, Nero has been uh, co-opted. It says, uh, Sacerdos co-optatus in omnia collegia supranumerum ex senatus consulta. Okay? In other words, Nero has been... Uh, um, uh, joined, uh, that's the wrong word, He's, Nero has been um, made a member uh, in every major college by decree of the Senate, beyond the regular number in some of them. That is, there are 15 members of one, he's number 16. But nevertheless, Nero, because he's now adopted as Claudius' heir and will be the next emperor, has to have all four religious colleges on his resume. And that's, why this, that's what this coin shows. So I think Agrippa had to go through the same process. <coughs> now, mind you, 
In AD 52, which is 65 years later, it's no longer as difficult for the emperor to disguise his, his regime as a monarchy. Claudius is very direct. I am an emperor. So he doesn't have to hide anything in republic. He doesn't have to hide anything in republic. He doesn't have to hide anything in republic.